So welcome, buddy. I'm Dr. Jun. I'm Dr. Isabel. So today we have an amazing, incredible special guest, uh, the doctor's name, Dr. Caitlin Sizowski, and he, she's a chiropractic doctor, a certified functional medicine practitioner, as well as an extensive trained speaker for the women's health and pregnancy, the pediatric. We really how she's passionate about really finding the true root cause of the problem in a very selected and very individual. So this is where all the rewards come through, the how this aha moment transformation happens. So she's gonna guide us how she helped us to expand our awareness towards health and well-being. So welcome to the Isamizu Global Conscious Awareness Channels. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you were telling us how passionate you are about finding the root cause of the problem or the symptoms or the signs that the patients are having. What are the most common symptoms that your patients come to your practice with? <laughs> or the That's an interesting, yeah. Honestly, it does vary, but the most common ones are either chronic fatigue, where no matter how much sleep they get, they never wake up feeling rested. They're always tired. They feel like they're literally running on fumes is one of them. Mm -hmm. Another one is brain fog, memory loss. So not remembering conversations, forgetting like, where did I put this? So it's happening earlier and earlier too. So I'm even having individuals in their mid to late thirties, forties, who are mm -hmm. uh, worried about early onset dementia, which not okay. Another thing we see a lot of is hormone imbalances, whether it be thyroid hormones or sex hormones, even insulin resistance is a huge one. Um, that tends to actually be one of the highest ones that we see coming into us, work, wanting to work with us one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but other things are like weight loss resistance, individuals who can't lose weight regardless of diet and exercise. They could have tried every single diet under the sun, tried a whole bunch of supplements, exercise, you know, their booty off, but they still can't lose weight. You know, those tend to be the biggest ones that we end up seeing, but the, the list of symptoms really does go on and on because everybody is so different. And just because somebody gets diagnosed with a certain disease doesn't mean they're all going to feel the same. They could have different symptoms, even though they have the same quote unquote diagnosed disease. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then one of the things that we always talk about is the connection of the PNEI, the psychological, neurological, endocrine, and immunological. It kind of becomes a snowball effect when all this systems get in unbalanced and then you touch a lot of it is hormonal has to do a lot of with the changes especially with women mm -hmm. and all the changes that they're having the majority go to the doctor the western doctor and say oh you're fine everything is fine have you had a lot of patients that come to your practice saying that they have told them everything is fine and they're not oh yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that happens a lot, especially with women. And I'm not sure if it's because most, you know, Western trained doctors, so in the United States and Canada, if they're only trained to look at hormones in blood work. The problem is when we look at hormones in blood work, we're only getting a snapshot. I like to explain it to my clients like it would be, I want to try and figure out the population size of, let's just say Seattle. And I'm going to do it by just counting the cars on the street. The problem is all of the cars on the street, some might have one person, some might have five people. It might be a bus that has 75 people in it, you know? So if we're only looking at the cars on the street and going to determine the population of that, we're not getting a very accurate picture of what's actually happening. Same thing when we look at blood work and hormones, especially if we're not looking at them at the right time of the cycle for women. So I find a lot of times either the blood work is being done at the wrong time of the month for menstruating women. They don't know what time of the month they did it. So we can't even go back and be like, okay, was it the luteal phase? Was it the follicular phase? Where were you at in your cycle? 
And then the other thing that I see happen all the time is full panels are not being ordered. So what's happening is we're trying to put together the whole puzzle, but we only have like five puzzle pieces out of a hundred piece puzzle. And we're trying to say, okay, this is what it actually looks like. This is the whole picture. This is what's going on. This is why you feel the way that you feel but we don't even have the full story to tell them why they feel that way. So I do feel like there's a whole bunch of reasons why these women are experiencing this and not getting the results that they're looking for, not getting the answers they're looking for is we have to dig deeper. We have to look at the bigger picture and then we have to know how to not just order the labs the right time of the month, but then how to interpret them based on what is going on. So I see that happen all the time, unfortunately. And I look forward to the day when, you know, that doesn't happen as much. That's so well said. I like that your analogy, puzzle oh, piece, yes. right? You mm -hmm. can have a hundred piece that we need to understand complete picture. You get a five of them, 95%, we don't know that. But then now if you expand awareness, thinking about how the diet is about you, right? As a DNA expression, your emotion, so many elements that comes in the picture. You get a 70% of puzzle piece comes together. Now you can really kind of start understanding whole what really we're looking at. Is that you know, you're referring to? 100%, yeah, when we have more of the puzzle, we have more of the picture, which then will dictate us where we have to look to fill in the other pieces, right? So if we're constantly trying to guess, and I hate guessing, I've never been a guesser. I tell my clients all the time, I test, I don't guess, because when I guess, I'm wrong, I'm human. You know, if you ask my husband, though, I'll say all the time, I'm never wrong, I'm always right. But that's just not true, you know, and every doctor is human. We do sometimes have our biases, especially if we quote unquote specialize in something. So, you know, if a doctor specializes in like Lyme disease, they're only ever going to look for Lyme and everybody is going to have Lyme, right? Or if somebody specializes in mold toxicity, they're only ever going to have, you know, mold type symptoms. And so you just got to figure out, okay, what do you have going on? What is it you're looking for? And then how can that direct you so that you can have a more complete puzzle? Because I do think there's no one doctor that's going to fill every single role in your healthcare needs. I do believe that we need to have, you know, a functional doctor that's going to help you with your lifestyle. I do believe you have to have the right dentist that's going to help you correct the mouth because I believe that majority of chronic disease actually starts in the mouth and if we don't address that we're never going to fix the problem. You're going to have to have somebody that's going to help you work with your energy. You're going to have to have somebody that's going to help you work on past traumas and um, trapped emotions. So there's a place for everything. And I have yet to meet somebody who is going to be able to do all of that for everybody. Oh, I love it. I love that you say that trapped emotions are a big part of it. And, and that's part of that psychological part of the PNEI. Um, can you go over that a little bit more about how your emotions can affect your mm -hmm. hormones, your body, your immune system? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how much time do we have though? Um, <laughs> so the thing about trapped emotions is when we don't feel our feelings and we just suppress them, we don't feel them, recognize them, honor them for what they are. Like, it's okay to be sad. And I tell my clients this, look, if you're sad, it's okay. Recognize it, understand what is making you sad and, you know, work through it instead of just pushing it aside. Because what happens is when we constantly push things aside, we actually rewire things in our body, in our brains. And as we rewire, we're not necessarily rewiring them for the better when we're trapping and suppressing emotions, whether it be, you know, sadness, frustration, anger, you know, the negative ones, because we don't typically suppress like happiness and joy and excitement 
moment and, you know, the positive ones, we tend to experience those and embrace them. It's the ones that make us feel not so good. And sometimes it's because we don't even know why we don't feel so good. So it's hard to recognize. And then when we suppress them, like I said, and constantly suppress them, we end up causing the, this rewiring pattern in our body. And depending on where it's rewiring is going to have different effects on us. Um, you know, back in Chinese medicine, they have different um organs that result or not result, but relate to different um, emotions. And so really, uh, you know, looking back at all of that, not to mention like the tooth meridian chart and really putting everything together, we can start to see, okay, what is actually happening with this person? And where do they even need to start? Because not everybody needs to start at the same place. However, um, everybody needs to start somewhere in order to take the step to better health. That's true. You, you talk a lot about the eating, um, not only the food, the, 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 it is important to just pay attention to what you eat, but also when you eat it. Can you explain a little bit about what you mean when, when to eat the right food? Yeah, so most people are so worried about what they're putting in their mouth, but they're not so concerned about how often they're putting it in their mouth. You know, as a society, we have, we can take food anytime because we have refrigeration, we have freezers, we can have fruit that is not technically in season, but we can eat it all year round. You know, we can get busy and sip on a hot cup of, a cup of coffee because we have like these crazy insulated cups now that will keep our coffee hot for five hours. And so we don't even think about it anymore. It's almost like an unconscious habit that we've developed. And the unfortunate part is every single time we put something in our mouth, what we're doing is we're suppressing our uh, ability to perform other functions because we have to digest it. And if you were to ask the average person, like, okay, how, how many times do you eat? They would probably say three, maybe four times when in reality, the average person is eating about 17 to 23 times in a day. And it's because eating is also drinking a kombucha, drinking, you know, your coffee throughout the day. So if you take five hours to drink your coffee, you're really eating far more frequently than if you just sat down enjoyed your cup of coffee while, you know, reading a book or listening to, you know, music that makes you feel well or driving to work or whatever it is, but like sitting down and enjoying it versus taking a sip and running around and taking a sip and running around. Because what happens is when we do that throughout the whole day, we're constantly activating our digestive system. We're constantly activating our digestive enzymes. And when we do that, that energy that we need to digest the food, absorb it, everything can no longer be used for healing, balancing hormones, creating hormones, you know, rewiring those circuits in our brain, whatever it may be. And so what ends up happening is we end up having a society who is literally creating um, the predisposition for prediabetes, because now when we go you know, three hours without putting something in our mouth, we get quote unquote, you know, hypoglycemic. Our blood sugar start to drop, which they're not even dropping if you were to have uh, like a glucose monitor that you check, but because our bloods um, and our body's so used to having blood sugars up in the 130s, 140s, um, you know, every two hours, when it goes down to 100 or even 90, 80, which is normal, our body freaks out and goes, oh my God, you're lightheaded and you're clammy and you're getting hangry now. And so part of the problem is not just the food we eat, like you said, it's when we eat it. So being conscious about when we're putting stuff in our body is so important and understanding that you know, that handful of nuts is eating, you know, the sipping on your coffee is eating 
let's be more mindful. Let's sit down. Let's take the time to actually eat so then we can digest our food and utilize the nutrients that we're actually uh, putting in our body versus these uh, highs and lows blood sugar spikes, which set us up for chronic disease, inflammation, you know, insulin resistance, you name it. So that's, that's part of it. I love it. You know, this, that is a profound information knowledge that many people are not paying attention to. So thank you so much for that, because I was like, okay, yes, remind me of, I've been sipping a tea, even, right? <laughs> Three, four hours. I've digesting many, many times. My enzyme going haywire. <laughs> well, and don't get me wrong. It's not that we don't do that on occasion, right? Because you'll even catch me doing it if I, like, my husband makes me a nice cup of coffee, and then I have a sip, and I put it down, and then I get enthralled in my work, what I'm doing, researching, whatever, and I'm like, oh, my coffee, and I'll have like another few sips and then put it down. So we all do it, but it's what we do more often that makes the bigger difference. So if it's something we're doing every single day, then that's when it comes problematic. If it's something that happens on occasion, then that's not going to be as big of a concern or as big of an issue long term. So I think I like, you know, what you're really describing for this, you know, eating, you know, diversity diets, you know, being conscious about this eating. And on top of it, I just thought about that too, that of course, most people are stressed when you're dealing with uh, 24-7, they secreting all the sympathetic nervous system stimulants, which all the cortisol rises there, digestion, resting, it's not going to work, right? So that's like kind of a snowball effect and the compounding, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And when we think about it, as a society, the bigger picture, most of us are in sympathetic overdrive all the time. We're go, 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 go. That like, you know, I'll, I'll sleep when I dead mentality it doesn't actually work. And that is so detrimental. Uh, you know, one of the things that I tell my clients is the one thing that I make sure I'm consistent with is the amount of sleep I get. I have to get eight to nine hours of sleep in order for me to actually function at my best the next day. Can I function on seven hours? Can I function on six hours? <laughs> it's not going to be nearly as good. I'm not going to be even close to as sharp and understanding things as I would be if I had that, um, that time to rest. And so what I find though, is a lot of my clients, they go to bed at like two in the morning and it's like, why are you going to bed at two in the morning? Well, just because I can. Well, the problem is, you know, as we go to bed later and later, the quality of sleep we get actually goes down and down and down. Uh, I think it's prior to midnight. For every hour you get to sleep before midnight, it's equivalent to two hours post. Meaning, so if you go to bed at 10, 10 to 12, it's a, four hours technically versus 12 to four, which is four hours, but that's really four hours instead of the two hours. So getting to bed earlier is so important because you're going to get better quality sleep and actually be more rested. And that's definitely not something that is um, encouraged in this day and age. It's go, 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 get everything done, you know, and it, it does have a, a huge impact and effect on our nervous system, not just you know how our hormones function and how we function the next day. That's great. Um, so you were talking a little bit about how important it is to have the ideal dentist and the right things. And I know your your one of your passions is about having the right dental work and the right dental treatment um, and how it impacts our, not only our health, but also if, if there is a pregnant woman can, and I saw that you posted something that was amazing about how it can transfer to the baby if there is something going on in their mouth. Let's talk a little bit about that juicy topic that a lot of people- juicy. So they can tell a little deeper. A little controversial for some people. Yeah, so I, I think you're referring to amalgam fillings, silver fillings, mercury fillings, and I'm going to say it because I'm not a dentist and they can't take my dentist license away. They are awful. They should never be put in anybody's mouth. And the problem is they still do it. 
my six-year-old niece actually just a few months back had two amalgam fillings, two mercury fillings put in her mouth, even though her mother told the dentist, I want composite BPA free fillings. And they went ahead and put the silver fillings in regardless. And she called me furious and was like, what do I do? And I was like, one, if it was me, I would write a board complaint because that is not okay. That is not informed consent. And two, now you have to deal with getting these out of her mouth because they off gas. So they release mercury vapor the entire time they're in your mouth. And we can increase the amount of mercury vapors that are released from those amalgam fillings with certain activities that we do on a daily basis, like brushing our teeth, drinking hot coffee or tea, chewing. If we grind our teeth, if we clench our teeth, you know, when you go to the dentist to get your teeth cleaned, all of those things increase the amount of mercury that's released. But the problem with the mercury, people go, well, it's different. It's not the same as in fish. That's actually so not true. So not true. Yes, it's elemental mercury that they put in our mouth, but there is a bacteria in our mouth called Streptococcus mutans, which everybody has. It's known to cause cavities when it's out of balance, but... What it does is when that mercury is off-gassing, that bacteria adds a methyl group to it, meaning it turns it into methylmercury. When it becomes methylated, it's a thousand times more toxic. It passes the blood-brain barrier. So the mercury goes straight to our brain, our pituitary gland, which controls our thyroid and our adrenals. So our metabolism, our body temperature, our cortisol response, our sleep-wake cycle, our sex hormones, it controls some pretty big things, but it also passes the placental barrier. So if a lady has silver fillings, has amalgam fillings, and she's pregnant, that mercury that's being released has an affinity to go to the fetus. So there's studies that have been done where they put radioactive mercury in amalgam fillings in both sheep and monkeys, uh, because sheep chew differently than us, right? So we have to do it on an animal that has a more similar like chewing mechanism. We don't grind our food like sheep do. We, we chew like monkeys. And what they found was within 30 days, they traced back the mercury to find out, okay, like where is it? And they found that it had accumulated in the fetus. So that means these babies don't ever have to actually have silver fillings to already be mercury toxic if the mom has them when they're pregnant with them. So there's so many things that need to be addressed. Like if you're ever going to have these removed, never, ever, ever go to a traditionally trained dentist. They have to have the right equipment to remove it. Because when you remove it, like think about it, if hot coffee, the heat from hot coffee speeds up the release of mercury vapors, what the heck is going to happen when the dentist is drilling it out, right? Because that's the only way you get it out. The sheer amount of mercury vapors that the individual is exposed to is insane. It's really high. And so they have to have special equipment and special procedures in place to mitigate and downregulate the amount of mercury that you're exposed to because you don't want to breathe that in. And if you do breathe it in, your body is going to absorb about 80% of what it breathes in. Only 20% is going to be excreted unless you take other precautions, like take the right binders and make sure your detoxification pathways are open. So there's steps that can be done, but it still has to be done with the right dentist. And the right dentist isn't just for amalgam removals, it's for so many other things that the mouth plays a huge role in, you know, like the microbiome from our mouth and our gut communicate with one another. So if one is off, the other one's going to be off and we're going to end up with symptoms. So it is so important to have a holistic, a biological dentist on your healthcare team that I tell some of my clients like, okay, look, sometimes we have to put off working with me until we can get what's happening in your mouth under control first. So it, it's that important. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing for that. I had a personal experience too. I had a seven amalgam feeling coming from Japan. That's a common procedure, as you know, as you know. 
and they are behind, 30 years behind than US, right? And I had to go through this radio procedure. I was detecting like a, quite a amount of mercury and I had to do extensive detoxification process to really finally remove. It took me at least like five years to really offset that. So personal experience, I can tell you that. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, and I'm glad you brought up the fact that it took you, no, I'm not glad that it took you five mm -hmm. years, but it does take that long to actually detox mercury out of our body. It doesn't just happen in, you know, one month from buying some kind of cleanse from the health food store. And two, you know, you got to, if you're going to do heavy metal detoxification, you have to work with somebody that knows what they're doing. Cause when we start using chelating agents, we have to make sure that the chelating agent and the binders are being used during their half-life. Meaning if we're using something that isn't strong enough to bind it, what it's going to do is it's just going to move it from one place to another in your body. It's not actually getting rid of it. And I've had many a clients come to me after doing other heavy metal detoxes and they're like, oh my God, it almost killed me. I feel worse. Well, yeah, because the binder you were using, you should have been taking it every three hours and you were taking it once a day. So what was happening is it was going in, it was stirring everything up, but there wasn't enough in there to constantly grab it to pull it out. It was just stirring it up and letting it go elsewhere. So it, it takes time. It usually takes years, just like you said. And you got to do it properly and safely with somebody that knows what the heck they're doing. Otherwise, you could end up in a worse situation than you were going in. So, so what kind of binders or um, what, what do you recommend people to do? Like they're interested in having it removed. Of course, going to a biological dentist is mm -hmm. the idea. Um, but then before like preparing the body for the removal of the amalgam and then afterwards any recommendation mm -hmm. that you can give them other than seeing a functional medicine that doctor yeah. that about it. great question because there are definitely things that should be done pre just to prepare your body just like you said so what we have to do is make sure your detoxification pathways are open and functioning because if they're not Anything that you're exposed to is just not going to be eliminated from your body. It's going to be absorbed and make a home somewhere. And probably it's going to be the brain. Um, that's its favorite place to go. The thyroid is another big one it likes to go. Um, so making sure your liver, kidney, lymphatics, that you're pooping properly, all of these things are really important. When it comes to binders, it's really important to be using one really clean binders, super clean binders, because binders like charcoal, activated charcoal is a great one. It's a really good binder. It's found naturally in, you know, the, the earth because well, that's where we get it from. But because it's a binder, if it's found in an area where there's other impurities, like if there's cadmium there in the soil, that charcoal is going to start to absorb the cadmium. And so if that uh, charcoal then gets turned into a supplement and you take it, you're now ingesting the charcoal that has the cadmium in it. And that's the last thing you'd want to do. So you want to make sure that your binders are always third party tested. Now, when it comes to things like, I know I'm going to get some kickback for this, but like Corella, cilantro, they are not good binders. They are not strong enough binders is the big thing. So when we're dealing with things like mercury, mercury is a heavy metal it's heavy that's why it's called a heavy metal okay. cilantro and even corella they're weak binders meaning they can go in they can grab it but they're not strong enough to hold on to it for you to eliminate it so my favorite example is if you were trying to do spring cleaning in your like master closet and you're like oh my gosh i got these weights and i have all these old boots and textbooks and all these things that i just don't need you pile them into a box. The box is now 150 pounds. And you're like, oh, gosh, you move it from your closet, but you can only move it to the hallway. You're not actually getting all of that stuff out of your house, just like the cilantro or the corella is not getting the mercury out of your body. It's just moving it from the master closet to the hallway. It's moving it from the thyroid to the pituitary. It's moving it from the liver to the kidney. 
So that's why it's so important to make sure that when you're doing a detox, you're using the right ones, which is why um, I created the dental detox to make sure that if someone's going to go through that, there's very specific steps that you can take to make sure that you are completely covered so that there is no redistribution. There is no um, additional exposure that is unnecessary for, you know, for where you're at ultimately. Ideally, we would never have to do it because they wouldn't be being placed. But, you know, until that time comes, we do have to make sure that we're taking the extra precautions. Yes, and it might take a while for that to happen. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Could you uh, share, how can we get this information for the dental detox? How can people Mm -hmm. access that? Yeah, well, so you can go to the website, thedentaldetox.com. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm just Dr. Caitlin Sazowski. I'm the only crazy one talking about amalgams and mercury. And um, I'm getting some interesting comments from... um, you know, other people saying that that's fine, you know, it stays locked in when in reality, it doesn't I just showed shared the video of the smoking tooth that I'm sure you guys have seen before, because it people just need to know that it's, it isn't what we're told it is, there's another story behind it. And we do need to have true informed consent whenever we're getting any procedure done, whether it's dental, whether it's chiropractic, whether it's massage therapy, whether it's Reiki, whether it's, you know, IV therapy, you know, it could be and seem the most inert thing, but we do need to understand everything that's involved with it so that we can make the proper decision, whether it's the right thing for us or not. And that's really what I'm hoping hoping to get across here is like, it doesn't matter what you say about amalgam fillings, I'm never going to get behind them. I'm never going to say that, yeah, it's a good idea to put it in someone's mouth um, ever. Like I just personally never see there ever being a situation where it's okay to do that. Yes, that's true. I haven't, I haven't placed an amalgam filling in probably 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you are one of the few who have gone above and beyond and look at things very differently, which is amazing. We do need more dentists like you out there promoting um, holistic biological dentistry, making sure that any type of dental work that you get done, it is the most inert thing possible for you which isn't necessarily going to be the most inert thing possible for me we're all different we all have different genetics we all are different like uh, bioenergetics so we're going to respond to things differently so just making sure that it's right for the individual is the most important thing so that's one of the things that I love about Uh, what you do, what Dr. Taylor does, and what some of the other holistic dentists that I've had the pleasure of uh, talking with, not necessarily getting dental work done, but um, at least I know that they're out there in their communities performing the similar uh, functions that you guys are doing as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Last recommendations for people to increase their health and well-being. Any, any, like, pearls that you you have that you recommend people yeah well it's funny because most of my simple pearls are things that dentists have been preaching for years but I'm going to put a a functional spin on it Mm -hmm. so unfortunately one of the biggest things that we're seeing in society now is high c-reactive protein so that's the marker in blood and that tells us somebody's um how likely they are to have a cardiovascular event ultimately. So how much inflammation they have within their cardiovascular system. So dentists have been preaching flossing for uh, decades, millennia, like it's been forever. And it's, they've been uh, telling you to do it to prevent cavities. Well, I'm going to tell you to floss to actually prevent inflammation from occurring in your cardiovascular system. What they found is when people floss once a day, their chance of having um, elevated C-reactive protein was almost non-existent. 
when those people stopped flossing though, their C-reactive protein rose and they were in the moderate risk of having a cardiovascular event. So something as simple as flossing can actually decrease your chance of having a heart attack or a stroke, not just preventing cavities. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is being mindful of what you're putting in your body at what time. Are you constantly grazing? Or are you being mindful and sitting down and having, truly having like three meals in a day or even two meals in a day or one meal in a day if you're practicing intermittent fasting, which by the way, women, you can intermittent fast. You just have to do it differently than men. Um, but those are some of the things that make the biggest impact on most people is reducing inflammation and reducing how often we're eating can downregulate systemic inflammation and upregulate every other function that we need, like better hormone balance, more energy, you name it. So those are probably the two biggest health tips that I think if everybody could start to incorporate, we would see a huge difference um, systemically as in within our communities when it comes to lasting health. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, what a pearls. Mm -hmm. uh, what, a, what a wisdom. Thank you. I think we took, took a witness to a 10 notes, maybe 20 notes <laughs> for sure. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you guys so much.